how many of you have ever heard of the term internal decapitation? That's right. Basically, I'm describing an injury where the skull become detached from the spine. Yesterday, I described the case of a 23-year-old man who was brought into the hospital after sustaining a high-speed automobile accident. First responders on the scene stated that the patient was going over 120 miles per hour. The car was demolished and he had to be extricated from the vehicle. He was a GCS of three on the scene and upon arrival to the emergency department, he had to be intubated. It basically means he had minimal signs of brain activity and had to be placed on life support. I showed the CT of the cervical spine that was performed that showed a significant increase between the space between C2 and the skull base. And that increased space or widening suggests ligamentous injury. This is called atlanto-occipital dissociation, also known as internal decapitation. That measurement that I'm looking at, basically we measure the skull base to the arch of C1, and if it's more than 12 millimeters, it suggests dissociation between the skull base and the spine. There's some other measurements that we can also use and one is called the powers ratio where you can calculate these two measurements to give us a number that may also imply OC dissociation. Here is our patient CT and when we measured from here to here it measured 12.5 millimeters. Normally the arch of C1 and the skull base are very close together so even seeing something like this on quick glance can indicate a huge Problem. I showed the coronal view and what I was trying to point out on this is the dissociation between the skull base and the arch of C1 and you can see the significant widening on the left as compared to the right side which would indicate distraction on the patient's left side of a skull from the C1 or cervical spine. So we probably had some type of high speed rotational injury that ripped his skull off his spine. The most common causes of this type of injury are car accidents or pedestrian versus vehicle in which the person is struck by a vehicle at a high rate of speed. It's three times more common in children than adults. And that's because of the laxity of ligaments in children as they grow. These are highly unstable injuries and anywhere from 70 to 80% of people will not survive this injury. In fact, people whose cause of death is from a cervical spine injury 20 to 30% of them are from this exact same type of injury. It's because it's so unstable, it will damage the brainstem and the patient will stop breathing at the scene. Some patients may be resuscitated at the hospital, but it's too late because the damage to the brain from anoxia or lack of oxygen has already been done. It is extremely rare to see one of these patients arrive at the hospital with this type of injury and we can do something to save their life. Further workup of a patient with this type of injury would be a CT angiogram while they're in the CT scanner to assess the status of their vertebral artery because if you stretch the vertebral artery, you can get decreased blood flow to the brain. We have two vertebral arteries on the left and right side that are two of the four vessels that supply blood flow to our brain. So if one or both of these vessels are injured, it can lead to a stroke. And unfortunately, in our patient, CT angiogram did confirm complete dissection of the left vertebral artery. Further workup, including a CT of his brain, also confirms significant brain trauma. So if we find this, what do we do? The patient needs urgent stabilization of the skull to the cervical spine. It's extremely important to ensure that the patient's airway is secure safely and the patient has immobilization of the cervical spine in a cervical collar or even a halo vest. The surgery requires hardware that stabilizes the skull to the cervical spine. And here is a cartoon depiction of what that looks like. And we lay bone graft down to help this area fuse together. Here is an x-ray of what that looks like. After stabilization like this, the patient will no longer be able to turn their head. The good news is that if a patient can survive this injury, over 90% of these types of rigid constructs will go on to fusion and a successful outcome. These types of surgeries are extremely challenging, should really only be done in the hands of a skilled spine surgeon. I do several of these types of surgeries per year and they're always one of the most stressful surgeries that I do. You're literally putting screws within millimeters of the brain and brainstem. I mentioned auto racing in the video yesterday and I asked for what device was developed to help prevent these types of injuries. Because in the early days of auto racing, even a minor accident could be fatal. In 1981, Patrick Jackmart was killed in an accident in which he struck a dirt bank and his car didn't even have barely any damage. He ended up with a skull fracture and brain damage that took his life. 
his brother-in-law, Dr. Bob Hubbard, and fellow auto racer, Jim Downing, came up with a device called the Hans device. Downing's knowledge of racing and Hubbard's knowledge of anatomy helped them make one of the most innovative safety restraints in motorsports. Hans stands for head and neck support. And this is essentially how it works. In a patient with seatbelt restraints, you can tell in a collision where the head and neck have extreme forces that are tangential to the spine and can cause severe trauma. And this is the Hans device, which is essentially a shoulder collar that attaches to the seat and the driver's helmet. Therefore, in the event of a crash, you significantly reduce the forces on the head and neck. It took years for this device to become a financial success. It was also thought that high-profile racing driver Dale Earnhardt Sr. may have survived his accident in 2001 if he was wearing this device. Now, most racing organizations require the use of the Hans device for all drivers. Statistics show that in NASCAR specifically, after the implementation of the Hans device, there has only been one fatality in auto accidents. But in other racing events where the Hans device is not required, over 126 deaths have been accounted. As many as 27% or 34 people may have been saved by this device. In fact, no Indy driver or NASCAR driver has been killed by a basilar skull fracture since the implementation of the Hans device. Now, back to our patient. Here's the MRI scan that was performed that shows significant injury to the cervical spine and brainstem. There is an epidural hematoma as well as extensive ligamentous injury to this patient's neck. And unfortunately, he did not survive his injuries. And those that do survive, they will have significant limitations due to their neurological damage or the surgical fixation that's required that will cause disability from limitations of their neck range of motion. Remember, always drive with your seatbelt restraints or other appropriate safety devices, particularly those in motorsports. And always, if you're in a vehicle, please maintain a safe speed. Hope you guys learned something from this video. Stay tuned next week and I'll go through another case.